What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi Shrinks at Sneakers.com. So if you haven't done it already, please like and subscribe to the channel so that I can keep making these videos. I wanna bring you the latest information in mental health and the latest information about the medications you might be taking or you might be prescribing. So with that said, let's, don't, let's dive right into the next topic and I wanna cover Brex Piprazole or Rexalti. And I wanna ask a simple question, is this medication the new Aripiprazole? So all that and more in this video segment. Let's start with the basics. Brexpiprazole is what we would call an atypical dopamine blocking medication that acts as a partial agonist. So if you've watched my video on aripiprazole, then you know that Brexpiprazole is pretty much the same with respect to the major mechanism of action, but I'm gonna talk about some of the key features here that make this partial agonist a little bit different. So it's a partial agonist at those D2 receptors. So D2 rece receptors always come up in psychiatry. It is the most common target for these dopamine blocking medications. This also has a serotonin dopamine activity modulator component to it, and I'll explain that later in the mechanism. But my main question is, is it really any better than aripiprazole. If they're both kind of work by the same mechanism of action, is there any point in prescribing this one over the other? And that's what we're gonna try to answer here. So this medication was approved for schizophrenia in 2015. So quite a bit of time has already passed, it's been on the market for a while. And it's also approved as an adjunctive treatment for depression, which I believe is actually the primary use for this medication. And I'll explain why in a little bit, but I think the depression adjunct is a much better indication than for schizophrenia as a primary medication. Now, one of the most important things with any psychiatric medication that we prescribe is knowing what the side effects are and knowing in some cases how we need to address them or treat them, but specifically for both the prescriber and the person taking the medication, they're gonna to wanna to know what those side effects are. And as you might imagine, if it's similar to aripiprazole, they're going to have similar side effects. So the side effects include things like akathisia. And akathisia is probably the most important side effect with respect to aripiprazole. And I think here it's also very common. So you want to be mindful of akathisia, but this is dose dependent. So obviously people who are taking lower doses will have less akathisia. Those taking higher doses will have more akathisia. There's also restlessness or activation, what we would call activating symptoms, and that would be things like restlessness and anxiety. So it's actually a little bit less with Rexalti and a little more with aripiprazole. So that's one place where they, they tried to change the mechanism and alter some of the properties to decrease the risk of activating symptoms like anxiety and restlessness. Weight gain is possible. It's less likely with this medication, but it can still happen similar to aripiprazole where you could still get weight gain, even though in the literature it's defined as a weight neutral medication. And there can also be sedation, headaches, abnormal involuntary movements, or EPS, right? And you can also find, you can also very rarely develop tardive dyskinesia. This is important for any of these medications. They all have the risk for tardive dyskinesia, but again, much less in a medication like this. And in very rare cases, this is important to know about aripiprazole as well, in very rare cases, patients can develop what they call impulse control problems. And these impulse control problems can be things like excessive gambling. So if you're noticing that the patient's complaining about trouble controlling their impulses and they're gambling excessively, you might wanna consider this medication as part of the issue if the gambling coincides or the impulsive behavior coincides with the start of this medication or aripiprazole. So brexpiprazole is a substrate for cytochrome P450 2D6 and cytochrome P453A4, and that's actually the same as aripiprazole. So it's kind of metabolized by the liver the same way by the exact same enzymes. So obviously things that are inhibitors of 2D6 or 3A4 could potentially raise your levels and things that are obviously inducers of those could potentially decrease your levels, plasma levels of brexpiprazole. Now, I want to spend some time on the psychopharmacology because I think it's important to understand how the medication works and why we think it works for these disorders. And I said it's approved for schizophrenia and depression, so let's look at why this medication might help somebody with schizophrenia or depression. The first thing I want to point out is that it's a partial agonist at serotonin 5-HT1A and dopamine D2 and D3. So there is some D3 activity here, and I'll show you guys a breakdown of the graph of the activity of each one. 
but it's a, and that makes it a little bit different, I think, than Eric Pippers all here. And also the 5-HT1A um, and 5-HT2A um, activity is actually much stronger, and I'll get to that in a minute. So it's a partial agonist, I and mean, I've explained this in the in the previous videos regarding aripiprazole. Partial agonist basically means that it can act as a blocker in some cases, and it can act as a stimulator of these receptors in other cases. So what happens with the partial agonist is they have both blocking and stimulating properties, which is why we think this works, you know, again in things like depression and not just schizophrenia, and that's why we think of this more as a dopamine modulating medication, because again, it's modulating the activity at those dopamine receptors, not necessarily you know, fully blocking and or activating. The difference between brexpiprazole and aripiprazole is that it has more blocking activity than stimulating activity. So the pharmaceutical companies, you know, they're not very clever. They don't come up with a whole lot of new drug ideas until recently. We've been seeing new drug, new drug design. But what they basically did was they said, well, aripiprazole has less blocking activity. Why don't we make a medication that has more blocking activity and see what happens? And so, you know, partially that's, that's the very basic way of thinking about this. But probably something that crossed the mind of the researchers designing the medication. So they have more blocking activity than stimulating activity at the dopamine receptors. And that's how they got this idea that it decreases agitation, restlessness, akathisia, etc. right? So if I have more blocking activity and less stimulating activity, I'm less likely to develop those side effects that were a problem for aripiprazole. So the goal was to make this medication more tolerable, not necessarily to make it more effective. So that's an important point right there. More tolerable, but not necessarily any more effective. So the other key points that I want to point out here about the serotonin receptors is that Braxpiprazole is more potent at 5-HT2A, 5-HT1A, and alpha-1B receptors than aripiprazole. So there's, there's more potent activity at those receptors than at those receptors if you're thinking about aripiprazole. So a little bit different there. And Braxpiprazole has a higher affinity for 5-HT1A receptors, and that may be possibly the mechanism that explains why the movement-related disorders like akathisia are lower with this medication. So again, they wanted to change this medication a little bit, uh, they want to change aripiprazole a little bit, make it a little bit more blocking activity, a little less activating, and hopefully reduce those pesky side effects like akathisia that can really cause problems in patients' lives. So that's what they did. Um, what else can we say here real quick? Uh, the antidepressant effects. So that's important. People will want to know, well, why am I getting an antipsychotic or, again, my preference is dopamine blocking medication. Why am I getting a dopamine blocking medication for depression? Well, that's because, like I've already pointed out, it hits a bunch of other receptors. And people always ask me, Dr. Rossi, can you show me the receptors? So in this video, I'm actually going to show you the receptors that it hits in, in detail. But um, basically, it also is going to affect and act as an antagonist at serotonin 5-HT2A, which I've already said, 2B, and 5-HT7. And 5-HT7 is a common um, antagonist uh, site where you do get antidepressant effects, and that's seen in other atypical medications as well. That's seen in other dopamine-blocking medications. So it's a common mechanism to provide some antidepressant effects. And that's what we think theoretically the antidepressant effects come from. Again, it's a little bit debatable depending on you know what you read in, in the literature and how much you believe the activity at these receptors is uh, accurately calculated. There is less activity at histamine H1 receptors than aripiprazole, so this actually might lead to less weight gain. Although, like I said, you still need to be mindful of weight gain in all of these medications. And another important point here, as far as mechanism goes and approvals go, please note, it is not approved for bipolar disorder or acute mania the way aripiprazole is. So this is an important difference. So in many cases, people ask me to point out the additional receptors that these drugs are going to target. And a lot of times I focus on the primary ones that are most important in the mechanism of action and the ones that we believe either cause the benefit and or side effects of the medication and I don't have time to talk about all the minor stimulation or blocking activity that's going on at the various other receptors. But for completeness, I'm going to show you this example. And it's going to break down every receptor that's involved with this medication's activity. Uh, the ones that I've already pointed out are the ones I'm going to focus on. Of course, the 5-HT1A, the 5-HT2A and 2B, as well as the 5-HT7, the dopamine D3, as well as D2 activity, 
And then we talked about histamine being lower in this medication as well as, um, as alpha receptors. So we were talking about alpha receptors a little bit, although that's not really that important. And then we can look at the bottom here at the serotonin transporter, the norepinephrine transporter, and the dopamine transporter. And you can see there is activity. It acts as a blocker at the serotonin transporter, the dopamine transporter, and not so much at the norepinephrine transporter. The dosing of this medication is quite simple, which is one of the things I actually do like about it, is that for schizophrenia, you're using very low doses. It's only two to four milligrams per day and that's titrated over the course of eight days to a maximum dose of four milligrams. So your max dose is only four milligrams, kind of simple. You start at two, work your way up to four, or depending on the clinical response, you may not have to get that high. If you're using this medication as a adjunct for depression, your doses are of course lower, similar to the way I think of aripiprazole being five to 10 milligrams for depression. And if you're not getting any benefit for the depression at 10 milligrams, you might wanna consider stopping the medication as the risks are likely outweighing the benefits. So for depression, two milligrams instead of the four milligrams for schizophrenia, and uh, there's nothing else really to say about the dosing. Very simple, very easy. I wanna kind of wrap this up with just a brief summary. The benefits appear to be mainly related to improved tolerability, right? When they redesigned this medication or they designed this medication, they wanted to improve tolerability. They wanted to lower the risk of EPS and lower the risk of akathisia, which were problematic side effects identified with aripiprazole. So they want to make this better than aripiprazole from a tolerability standpoint, but not necessarily make it any more effective or efficacy. And like I said, clinically, I think, you know, if, you, if you've ever prescribed this medication or you've ever had patients on this medication, you might be wondering, um, you know, if it's, if it's really any good at all, especially in the case of schizophrenia. So that brings me to my next point, which is that in my practice, I tend to use this as an adjunctive treatment for depression and in conjunction with an SSRI or SNRI. So if somebody has an inadequate response or partial response to a serotonin drug or a serotonin norepinephrine medication, then I'm going to add this medication in potentially, maybe. I mean, it might not be my go-to choice, but it's available. I may use this to treat the depression and hopefully get remission instead of just a response. I believe the efficacy in this medication, schizophrenia, is limited, and that's based on my own clinical experience. Um, the research will obviously tell you it's FDA approved and does improve schizophrenia, but again, aripiprazole, in my opinion, as well as uh, braxpiprazole here, or braxpiprazole, you will see less clinical response, and that's just based on my own clinical experience working with the medication. This medication also may improve cognitive function in schizophrenia, but again, that's kind of debatable. No one really knows whether or not that's true, but it has been, uh, has been thought about and has been researched a little bit, but there's no real definitive evidence to support its improved cognitive function in schizophrenia. And there's actually some evidence recently to support its use in PTSD in combination with sertraline. And that kind of makes sense because if someone's having an inadequate response to the serotonin medications in PTSD, then you might jump to a medication like this to kind of adjunct and hopefully bring that person closer to remission because that's always our goal. We're not looking for just a response, but we're looking for remission. I'm gonna end the video there. If you guys have questions or comments, drop them below. I'd be happy to answer them. And uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Like I said, it helps me to keep making these videos and to know they're valuable.